Say, remember. Remember. Have you ever had like a canker sore? You know, like a really, really bad one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Like one that like you literally can't think of anything else because you got this stupid canker sore. You're like, oh, my gosh. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life, right? I'm going to burn it all down because I got this canker sore. What about a hangnail? Anybody like... It's like so bad, or maybe you cut it too qu- close to the quick, right? And you're like, will this suffering ever end? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I ask you this. Do you remember when it stopped? Yes. We most of the time don't, do we? We, we, don't rem- we remember the pain of the canker sore, but we don't remember when it stopped. We forget. We forget so easily, don't we? Oh, man, we forget. Relationships are built on remembrance. I remember um, my, my grandpa was getting dementia, and he was in kind of the old folks' home there in Beaver, Oklahoma. And right across the street, my wife's uh, dad, um, before we were married, um, was the pastor there. He had me preach. I, I remember I was wearing all black, you know. I don't know why. I just wore black suit pants and a black shirt. I thought Zorro was pretty cool. And um, I went over to see my grandpa. My grandpa recoiled up against the wall, and he's like, get away, devil, get away, devil. He literally thought I was the devil. He didn't remember that I was his grandson. And uh, it kind of it shook me as a you know, 16, 17-year-old kid. Uh, it made me kind of not maybe want to go see him quite as much. And I know that's not right, but for a 16, 17-year-old kid, it was kind of traumatic for your grandpa to call you the devil. <laughs> you know? And so memory helps build relationships. Someone say, remember. remember. There's a power in remember. It's when you remember someone's birthday or some specific thing about them that's just kind of this idiosyncrasy, and they're like, whoa, you remembered? What? I've got a friend, uh, Amanda Brookhart. She remembers everything. She could tell you my order at any restaurant. I'm like, that's a little weird, but I love you, and I know that you love me because you know everything. You remember, right? There's also a, a price tag to forgetting. Men. forgetting her birthday or valentine's day valentine's day is easy because like everybody should know that one right but oh christmas yes go ahead and get her the gift when she says she doesn't want one she's lying okay (laughs) forgetting someone's name it's crazy there's unrealistic expectations on preachers that we're supposed to know everyone's name and some people will think that God doesn't love them because I might forget their name. If Mikey doesn't remember my name, God doesn't love me. I'm like, where did you get that from? I'm just a human. But seriously, there's a price tag to forgetting some things. Or maybe your homework's like due date. Ah, oh, I thought it was next week. We spend a whole section of our lives looking for our shoes and our phones. Uh-huh. Carrie. And... Uh, I can't tell you how many times a week I have to call her phone. <laughs> it's buzzing off somewhere in the couch or something. So what's the big deal about remembering? Someone say, remember. remember. Let's go to the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, actually, I want you to go to the book of Joshua. I want you to go to the book of Joshua. We're going to start this story back in Exodus. In Exodus, the Hebrew people find themselves as slaves to the Pharaoh of Egypt. Anybody see Prince of Egypt? Yeah. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've seen it. If you haven't, it's such a good movie. Even as an adult to this day, I love Prince of Egypt. And, um, and God uh, raises up this man named Moses to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. So Moses goes, and the Pharaoh doesn't want to let his slaves go. He's like, I need my people back. And, and the Pharaoh says, I don't want to give you your people back. And so God gives them 10 plagues. The last one was, is slaying the um, eldest of every family. that didn't have the blood on the doorpost. Long story, don't got time to go into it. Finally, the Pharaoh breaks and he says, fine, leave. And so they leave, and they, they start to go towards the Red Sea. And Pharaoh says, you know what? Instead of letting you leave, I'm going to go get you and bring you back. So his army chases him down to the Red Sea. The uh, children of Israel are surrounded by water on three sides. They look back. There's mountains right there. They just come out of this, you know, like, like narrow pass. And here comes Pharaoh's army. And they're not a fighting people. They are not warrior class. These people are, have been slaves for a long time now. So they don't know how to fight. And they're like, God, you got to do something. 
God brings down a pillar of fire and stops Pharaoh's army. Meanwhile, he tells Moses to step out into the water, put his rod over the water, and the water splits, and it says like a wall on the, this side and a wall on that side. They cross over on dry ground. Then God lets the fire down. Pharaoh's army comes, and then the waters come in on them. And right at the end of that, Exodus 13 says this, and Moses said to the people, remember, someone say remember. This day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, out of the house of slavery, you were slaves. You were not slaves anymore. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. God begins to feed them with manna, which means, what is it? That's the name of manna. Manna means, what is it? Because they're like, I don't know what this is. But somebody put it in their mouth and like, hey, it tastes pretty good. It's like cornflakes. <laughs> You should try it. So now everyone's eating the manna, and it's great. And, and God started, it's basically bread from heaven on the ground right at their tent door. They don't, I mean, they don't have to go hunt or anything. They just go and gather it. But they had to trust God for just to gather just enough for the day because if they tried to gather enough, if they got, to get a, little, if they got a little fearful that maybe... Hello? If they, got, if they thought that maybe God wouldn't come through tomorrow and they gathered a little bit much, they started living in fear, then it would rot overnight. So he says, just get enough for the day. Why? Because this is the picture of what we are supposed to follow, how we're supposed to follow God, trusting him for the day, knowing that tomorrow he's going to come through. He can do it again. Amen? But they get a little bit bored of eating manna. They're going around, you know, and they, they're like, I'm tired of this. And they forget. Someone say forget. Yeah. Numbers 11 tells us a story. The children of Israel wept. They're so mad. They're so tired of eating that flatbread. You know, they're so tired of going to Subway that the children of Israel weep. And they're like, who will give us meat to eat? We want meat. We want the meat pots of Egypt. Moses says, hey, don't you remember the day that God delivered us from the, the Egyptians and slavery? And they said, oh, we remember, all right, verse 5, we remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt. Oh, and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks, the leeks, the leeks, and the onions and the garlic. That's what we remember. Like, whoa, 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 God just delivered us out of the Red Sea. A non-warrior people running from a warrior people. God's fire, you remember that? Would I, we weren't all smoking crack. We all did this together. You remember? I remember cucumbers and leeks. That's what the people say. <laughs> And they begin to fantasize about the good old days that weren't good at all. They were, do you remember you were a slave? Oh, I remember when we used to have the meat pots. Oh, man, those barbecues. Yeah, while that guy was whipping you on the back while you were baking bricks in the hot sun, and they don't even give you straw to build it. Those were the good old days. Oh, but why did God bring me out here to die? Oh, how quickly we forget. Amen? Oh, may it not be. It wasn't good at all. They continue, verse 6. Now our whole being is dried up in this desert. There's nothing at all except for this manna before our eyes. But all this, what is it? We don't even know what it is. We still don't know what it is. It's in front of us. Moses goes to God. He's like, hey, I didn't have these kids. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, what do you want me to do with them? And God says, oh, I'm going to give them some meat to eat. I'm going to give them so much meat that it's going to be coming out their nose. And uh, so all this quail drops. They start eating the quail, and then, um, and then, and then they get tired of the quail. <laughs> it's like, come on, people. And they go through this cycle of forgetting and going through a hard time. And then God raises someone up to stand in the gap on behalf of the people. God delivers them, and they remember, oh, yeah, God. And then they forget. And then it's this whole thing. It's like a national dementia. National dementia. Forgetting. Forgetting. Someone will say forgetting. forgetting. So the children of Israel, they get from Egypt, and they wander their way up to the Jordan River. And they go they take, to take their inheritance. And, and, and they, they, Moses sends out 12 spies. You might remember this old song that uh, 10 were bad and 2 were good, right? 10 spies go out, and they come back, and they're like, no way, dude. We cannot do this. 
There's giants in the land. Yeah, there's big grapes as big as your head, but we can't go in. Like, there's, this, is, this, is un, this is an unwise investment. I don't think this would be a thing that we need to do at this time. And uh, I think if we look at all of our statements and everything, I just don't think it's wise for us to go into this promised land that God's promised for us to come to. And two of them were good spies. Two of them were Joshua and Caleb who end up going into the promised land 40 years later. And they're like, no, I know there's giants, but did God not just bring us through the Red Sea? Did he not just deliver us out of all of this, this stuff? And now we can go in here. If God brought us this far, if he did it then, he can do it again. Amen? Amen. Someone say, if he did it then, he can do it again. If he did it then, he can do it again. And if he did it then, this is our story, people. This isn't some old storybook. This is your story. This is my story. This is a continuation of our story. If he did it then, he can do it again. Amen? Amen. Oh, 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 glory. <laughs> God ushers them away because they decide not to go in, and so God's like, okay, fine. So for 40 years, they wander in the desert until everyone dies off except for Joshua and Caleb, the two spies who went in and said, we can do this because they trusted in God. And God ushers them right back after 40 years, right back to the same place where they failed or earlier, 40 years before, the Jordan River, and they stand there. Giants are still there. Nothing has changed there, but we got a same faithful God who's also there who can lead us through. God says in Deuteronomy 7, 18, you shall not be afraid of these giants. So be afraid of them. You shall remember. Someone say, remember. Remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh in Egypt. Do you, don't you remember that? And you shall remember, someone say remember, that the Lord your God had led you all these 40 years into the wilderness to humble you and to test you. See, sometimes you got to get Egypt kicked out of you. Now, now they got out of Egypt, but, but, but that desert kicked Egypt out of them. Sometimes you got to get humbled and, and the desert is a place to test you, to boil all of that stuff up to the top, all those impurities, to scrape them off, and you can walk in to your promise. Verse 7, the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, land of brooks of water and fountains and springs. God says this over and over and over. Remember, 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 remember. Don't forget. Remember, remember, remember. But we forget, 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 forget. And before we make fun too much, of those Israelite idiots. We do the same thing, don't we? Oh, we forget. Uh, anybody ever read the book 1984? I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. I read it recently, and it's scary how close to <laughs> home it hits. Makes you be like, you know what? Maybe I should put this thing down because I'm pretty sure we are a part of the party. There's a totalitarian regime called the party who monitors your every action and your thought. They have thought police. You might have heard that phrase, thought police. And there's this guy named Winston Smith who works for the Ministry of Truth, which is all about lies. And his responsibility is to change historical records so that they match whatever the party says is true about history. Sound familiar? He throws unwanted history or, or articles and things that the party's not, he throws it in this hole in the wall. It's called the memory hole, and it goes down to a furnace that burns it. And then it, it's basically gaslighting at its finest. It's like, hey, we're at war with these people. No, we're not. We've never been at war with those people. We're actually at war with these people. Like, really, where? And look at all the headlines. There's no news anywhere of what was actually happening the week before. That's what's going on in this book, 1984. Of course, it's fiction. And um, he throws these things down in the memory hole. And in this book, he rebels against Big Brother. He's like, I think there's something else going on here. Big Brother is the name of, the, of this kind of organization of the Ministry of Truth. And it leads to his arrest, his capture. And then he gets tortured by this guy named O'Brien. And O'Brien says this, who controls the past controls the future. And who controls the present controls the past. So whoever's in control right now, we control the past. We change history to fit what we say it is in our paradigm. And whoever can control the past, this is how it's always been, can control your future. It's a heady, heady kind of thing to think about. God says over and over and over, remember, 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 because we have a tendency to forget as individuals, as a church, as a people, and, uh, you know, as a nation. How many, how many guys have heard the argument that we were not a Christian nation? We weren't built as a Christian nation, that, that the forefathers were just deists, that they weren't actually Christians and stuff like that. Do you guys have like professors in poli sci trying to tell you that we're, we weren't, the Constitution wasn't a Christian document, that, that um, you know, all these kind of things, right? 
If you haven't heard it, you might be in a hole somewhere uh, because this is the thing going on. This wasn't a Christian nation. It's never been a Christian nation. Christian nationalism is the worst thing that could ever be. Okay, well, cool. The ACLU contends the founders did not see laws biblically based. The Constitution was only a secular document. It had no bearings in biblical truths whatsoever. However, in George Washington's farewell address... He said that we can't forget God. In fact, he said religion and morality are indispensable supports if we're going to continue as a nation. Oh. So not freedom from religion. Okay. President Woodrow Wilson, I got a whole bunch more, but I had to narrow it down for time's sake. President Woodrow Wilson said this, a nation which does not remember, someone say remember, what it was yesterday does not know what it is today nor what it's trying to do. The Bible, he, he no, no, notes, the Bible is the one supreme source of revelation of meaning of life. America was born a Christian nation. And I got all these other presidents like Lincoln and various other ones who have quoted to say just about the same thing. Again, as Orwell said in 1984, who controls the past controls the future and whoever controls the present controls the past. So these poli sci professors can make you think that there was no involvement with God whatsoever, that they were just deists but not actually Christians. Then we can say that then, then, then Christianity has no basis for pushing its morality on anything going forward. Make sense? Just as historical revisionists have been gaslighting and trying to change your view of history to fit their pagan paradigm, your enemy, the devil, who walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, is trying to get you to only see the desert but not the miracle. He wants you to remember the desert, but he wants you to forget the miracles. Do you hear me? Seniors, do you hear me? I can't tell you how many sat on student exec who fell away from God just months after they left this place. I can name four or five right now off the top of my head. And it's sad. Paul says this, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in the light. Which means he has no greater sorrow than to watch them walk in darkness. Whatever you do, don't forget what God did here. Amen? Amen. He wants you, the enemy wants you to only see the desert but forget the miracle. If, he can just, if they can just make us forget who we were and why we are here, then we will change, it will change your future. Have you ever been walking into a room and you're like, why, why, why did I come in here? What am I doing here? <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're like, what was I doing? Because you forgot your past. The past was like, hey, I need to go and get my shoes. You walk in, you forget what you're up to, and you're like, I don't even know what I'm doing. And for a long time, that messes with your future because your present is just walking around trying to remember what you were up to. Someone say, Remember. They will change the future. And let me ask you this, people, not just seniors, but everyone in this room, who will control your past? Who will you let control your past? Have you ever heard of the Mandela effect? <laughs> you remember, like the monocle on the guy on um, uh, Monopoly, right? He actually doesn't have a monocle, but you think he did because your mind fills in those gaps. Who will you let control your past and how things actually were? And reframe it and change it. Today is April 25th, and this is the present, but five years from now, it will be your past. And I ask again, who will control your past? When you look back on these four years, what will you remember? What will you remember about this time, this moment? Satan tries to get you to forget the good things that God has done, and he tries to twist your memory about the bad things and make you look just at the bad things and get you thinking about that. Let me ask you this. When you think about those times when we went to like fifth quarter uh, after a long day of tailgating and a football game and then fifth quarter, and then we go to IHOP after, and then it takes the waiter till like three in the morning to get your order, right? And when you think of IHOP and you think about those moments, do you think just about how you didn't get your order and how frustrated you were till three in the morning? Yes. <laughs> or do you think of that really cool conversation you had with somebody you might not have had? The enemy is going to try to get you just to think about how long it took to get your order and to forget about that cool conversation you had. That might have been life-changing in that moment that you forgot about. Will you remember it as the accuser, as Satan, as that dragon of old, that serpent of old wants you to remember it? Or will you see it as it actually is the way that God wants you to remember it? Will you remember the thirst of the desert? Will you remember whenever he came out and and, and broke that rock and the water came gushing out 
of the rock? Will you remember the desert season of hunger or will you remember the manna that he fed you in the, when you couldn't feed yourself? Will you remember the Wesley as a place of sacrifice and work and oh my gosh, Tuesdays were so long and hard difficult, or will you remember this place, a place where miracles happened? <sighs> will you remember the pain of the conviction of God? Like every time I went to church, every time I went to the two posts, I felt God messing with my heart and shaping it. It was painful, the conviction. And I would say, okay, God, you can have it all again and again and again. And you run to the Father again and again and again. And you remember that. Will you remember that as pain of conviction or will you remember the freedom and holiness that came afterwards? Amen. Will you remember the pain of the conflicts from church friends, people you served alongside in Fusion, people you served alongside in a resource team, per people you, 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 you thought should have loved you a little bit different? Will you remember that conflict or will you remember that when you did the Matthew 18 approach and you did conflict correctly and it created the doorway to intimacy and your friendship actually grew stronger because you handled conflict correctly, will you remember the depth of intimacy or just the conflict? Mm. Will you remember the times when you were church hurt or church healed? Yeah. Oh, we throw that phrase around. To, not to diminish abuse and all this kind of stuff. Oh my goodness, if you were on my Facebook wall, you would have saw this crazy war that broke out. I just asked that simple question. We talk about church hurt all the time. All the time. Almost like we use trauma, like it's just like we just throw it on everything. Not everything is trauma, by the way. And you shouldn't classify it as trauma if it's not trauma. Otherwise, you're going to really mess up all kinds of other things in your life and everyone else's too. One, by messing up definitions, changing words and language that means certain things to mean something else, and, the, and then it paints you in a different picture. That's a whole other story. And this war broke out, and I was like, I'm honestly just asking, do you remember the times that when you had a baby, and uh, like, like when we had a baby in this church, you know, Sunday school class brought us meal after meal after meal after meal. Or when I was near suicidal and Rick, Pastor Rick sent me to counseling and paid for it and I got my, my head right. That's church healed. What if we start a new hashtag, church healed everybody, and we just start talking about what all God's doing and all the cool things he's doing through the people of God, amen? Yeah. Holy cow. I mean, yes, the darkness is out there. Yes, there's an army, but according to Kings 6, man, there's another army of heaven all around it that's bigger than the army on the ground. So let's, let's be careful with that word, church hurt. Because it sounds a lot to me like the accuser. Just pointing at everyone else. Think about this. Who have you church hurt? Have you hurt somebody? Well, you're a part of their church hurt. Well, then let's all forgive and get over it. Amen? You can't say that, Mikey. What will you remember? The desert or the manna? The dryness or when God broke open the rock and poured the water out, what will you remember of this place? What will you remember of your time on this earth? Guys, I am so sore right now. I have pulled something, I think. Um, I don't know what it was, but I was, doing, uh, I was doing squats and everything with Macy the other day, and I remember it was like, I'm only like three weeks in, and I'm, I hate it. I hate working out. I know I used to like it, but there's nothing good about it. Not... <laughs> Not one dang good thing. But, it's, you know, it's not getting, it's actually, that was week one. Now, week three, I'm like, eh, it's not quite so bad. And I'm sure I'm going to be later saying, you should work out, and you should work out, and you should work out. But right now, listen, it's not all that great, okay? <laughs> and my question to you is this, will you just remember the pains, or will you remember the gains? <laughs> oh, girl. Someone say, oh, girl. Oh, girl. Romans 5. I want you to, man, I want you to write this little address down in your little books. You studious note takers, you write this down. Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, we glory in our sufferings. We actually thank God for the desert because it beats the Egypt right out of you. We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. We wouldn't get the perseverance if we didn't go through suffering. Perseverance then creates character inside of you. Character then produces hope inside of you. And hope does not disappoint. When he saved you, he brought you out of Egypt, but now God is beating Egypt out of you. Uh, Hebrews 12, 11 says this, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Oh, but the gains, someone say the gains. 
the pain, it's painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness, of peace. Do you need peace in your life? Yes. Then let God put you through the desert and put you through the pain. Because trial worketh patience, patience, character, and character, hope. You don't get to hope without the pain. You don't get the gains. Then 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. We do not lose heart, guys. We do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet inward, our, the inward man is being renewed day by day for our light affliction. He calls it light. Your light, church hurt. Your light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far better and exceedingly in eternal weight of glory. While we do not look to the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. Jesus says, blessed is he who does not see and still believes. For the things which are seen are just temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Did you ever notice that your clothes didn't wear out for 40 years? That your ankles didn't swell while you're walking through that desert? Oh yeah, you know, now that I think about it, I don't have any canker sores. Why don't we just, does anybody have a canker sore in here right now? Raise your hand. Two people have canker sores. Okay, you keep, you don't, but everyone else, I want you to look up and say, thank you, Jesus, I don't have canker sore. Right now. <laughs> and I want you to think about it. No, no, actually, thank you. God, really, thank you, I don't have canker sores. Right now. We never thank him for the thousands of planes that don't crash. We sure blame him for the one that does. And that's not even his fault. It's probably a mechanical error by a human. And we blame God for it. Come on. Oh, what will you remember? Because your enemy wants to color your past. He wants to reframe it. He wants to gaslight you. He wants to change your memory. And he wants to ask you questions. He'll come up with questions like the serpent did in Genesis 3 and said, did God really say not to have that, that you couldn't have that? Did he really say that? And you'll start to entertain the idea, well, maybe, maybe I was wrong. He wants you to forget the things God did over these four years. Or eight, wherever Chase is. <laughs> he wants you to think that you missed out, maybe. I hear this from some alumni. Don't fall into this trap. Man, we could have, we spent so much time setting up and tearing down two posts and doing events and freshman parties and stuff. Man, I really could, man, we could have like, men, like, we could have like slept with all the ladies. We could have partied. We could have got our wild oats out there. Man, I haven't had my parents asking me why. Not me, but other people have told me this. My parents are like, man, you're in college. Why don't you live it up, man? Why don't you go party? And let me ask you this. Will the enemy make you think you wasted your time here by doing something that's unseen, that's eternal? Oh, may it never be. To those of you who are Christian, you know, who, who don't go down, that, that, that might not be your thing. You might have said, man, why did I spend so much time reaching out to people I didn't know and trying to make them feel welcome when I could have just gotten a little friend group? And man, we could have been like friends, you know, the TV show, and it's just the four of us, and we could have just had our great time all the way through. We could have built deep instead of wide with all these people that needed friends. That's how it can work. That's how it can work. Will you forget the times in Tupos when these, these indescribable moments, when God turns the dial one little bit at a time from glory to glory and you're being transformed to the very image of Christ over four years and, and it's indescribable to the point where when your parents are like, what's the big deal with this place? And you're like, man, I don't, I don't even know how to explain. You just have to come and see. Will you forget that? Will, you, will your enemy get you to think that this was just emotionalism or just young naivety? He wants you to forget what happened here. It was invisible, but it was eternal. And it's the stuff that never goes away. You'll see it again one day up there. That's the hope, amen? So God brings the children of Israel back to this river, the River Jordan. God takes Moses up on a mountain and takes him home, buries him there. And, and, he, continues, and he comes back to Joshua, and he says this in Joshua. So we're coming to Joshua, chapter 1, verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Joshua approaches the river. He's looking at it. He's like, it's pretty impossible. I know you did the Red Sea then. Will you do it again? I know you were with Moses, God, and you met him on the mountain, but will you be with me? I know the people, they followed you, Moses, but will they follow 
me. Maybe Moses was special. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I don't got what it takes. Maybe I'm not enough. I don't know if you've ever had that thought before. Maybe uh, the rest of you guys, these seniors are graduating and going on, and maybe some of you are stepping up into their leadership position, and you say, wow, God was really with Emma, but will he be with me? God was with Brantley, but will he be with me? God was with Caleb, but will he be with me? Joshua 3, 7, God, he answers right away. He says, God says, I am with you just like I was with Moses, because his plan is bigger than any man. If I did it then, oh, girl, don't you know I can do it again? He pulls out the old photo album, and he says, hey, check this out. Do you remember when at Ramses I made Pharaoh let your people go? And and, and at Succoth, do you remember that? Oh, Succoth, what a place, right? I led you by a cloud by day, and I led you by a fire by night. And then at this crazy place that you happened to end up at, Pihahuroth, you... Play, you passed through the Red Sea with a wall of water on your right and a wall of water on your left. And at Mara, at Mara's place, man, did you know, do you remember whenever the, you needed water and you were so thirsty and it was, it was salt water, but then, then, then I healed it and it turned into pure water? You remember that? Pure water came back. And then at Elim, if he did it, then he can do it again. Come on. Come on. Oh, and, and, and don't you remember at Elim, when you got thirsty again, I brought you to an oasis with palm trees to shade you. Do you remember at the wilderness of sin? I don't know if you've ever been hanging out in the wilderness of sin. But <laughs> at the wilderness of sin, I rained down bread from, Hannah, from heaven and quail manna from heaven. Rephidim, man, when, when an army attacked you and you guys were not fighters, do you remember that? But then I caused you to fight them, the armies of Amalek, and, and you won. Do you remember that? Or how about at Mount Sinai, whenever I revealed myself, my ways, my personality to Moses, and I gave you the Ten Commandments, and I showed you, this is how we're going to go forward. Do you remember that? And now I tell you, I tell you, Joshua, just as Moses did back then, and I was there for him, I will do it again. I'm with you at the River Jordan. It can happen again. And he says this, if I came for it, then I'll do it again. Joshua 4, 4. Then Joshua called the 12 men who had come and appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe, 12 guys. Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the midst of the Jordan. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna step out. We're in faith. The river's going to go back. They're like, wait, are you sure about this? Yes. Yep. <laughs> And we're going to step in the river, and the river's going to go back. And while we're standing in the river with the presence of God and the Ark of the Covenant, and all the people pass through, you are going to take 12 stones like this big bad boy, and you're going to put it on your shoulder, and you're going to carry it out of the river. You're going to take something that belongs in the bottom of the river, and you're going to put it on your shoulder, and you're going to carry it out of that river, and you're going to put it over here in this other place where it doesn't your children come by and they look at this rock they're like wow that rock doesn't belong there what's that rock doing there who brought that stone out that you will say to your children don't you remember when the holy spirit opened up a door that no one can shut that whenever that rock goes in the bottom of the this place it doesn't belong out here but it's out here and it shows for everybody it's the photo album of every time god came through let me tell you how god came through for me you sometimes you got to have a stone 12 stones man you got to have a stone of remembrance it's like a receipt see that devil comes up to you and say god didn't do anything he's like uh, actually i got the receipt this is what god God did. You want to see what God did? I got a receipt for it. You try to tell me God won't come through? Uh, looky here, buddy. This came from the bottom of the, uh, not the Red Sea, of the, of the Jordan River. And if he did it then, he'll do it again. Someone say praise God. Church, you need, you need, you need 12 stones. Get your 12 stones out of the bottom of the river tonight. He says this in verse 7, and these stones shall be a memorial. Someone say memorial. Memorial. To the children of Israel. For how long? Forever. It's probably much bigger than this stone here. These big stones were pillars 
a reminder, a receipt of what God had done. A memorial. What's a memorial? We're about to come up to Memorial Day. You remember those who went on before. You set up a gravestone. It tells when they were born and when they died. So just in case you forget, there's a dash right in the middle that tells about their lifespan. It said they were here and they did something and it changed something. It'll be a little marker on there that says this is where so-and-so lies and this is what they did, a memorial. These 12 stones were a memorial to remind us who God is and what God did, a receipt when the devil tries to steal that joy from you. Say, oh man, it's a bad day. Let me just tell you something. This row has been filled year after year. Coop, am I right? Every, every year it's filled up. And every now and then, I will look at this and about this many of them didn't make it a year from now. And I'll start to wonder if God is even real. Does it even work? Was it just a phase? That was the name of the last time I preached this sermon. The last week was just a phase. Three of those walked away. It was just a phase. Unless they come back before God comes back, then it's all over for them. That is the real deal. Sometimes you forget, so you just got to hold up this receipt and say, No, I remember. I remember. I remember when God came through. I have a couple of receipts. Uh, John Maxwell says it's really important to have like a photo album because a photo album has this beautiful way of like you open it up and you're like, oh man, do you remember that? And, and, and there's something inside your brain that goes back to that moment. You hear a certain song, it takes you right back. You smell a certain smell, it takes you right back to that moment. Those are memorials. Those are moments that take you back to a moment in time where something important happened. Some of the memorials I have, man, was in 1999, uh, right there at Perryton High School, back when those big old pants were a big deal. And they're coming back, y'all. Cargo pants. We were at Sea at the Pole. And I'm preaching the gospel right there. I'd just come back from a mission trip from Peru. I'd seen people healed. I'm preaching the gospel at the pole. It's not, I mean, this doesn't happen all the time, but I was like, there's about 100 people there. And I was like, in the name of Jesus, man, this thing is not a game. Guys, we can't be lukewarm. God will spit you out of his mouth. I remember this. Sermon. It was just off the top of my head. I was like, guys, we got to get right with Jesus right now. And it's like, if you want to get right with Jesus, come meet me at the pole. And this whole group of people came to the pole. And I will never forget when God came through with those it's a part where god came through this is a memorial to remind me god still changes things even through a, a 17 year old kid i got another memorial man is when i married my best friend and i remember there being some kind of a tradition where you carry them uh, but I thought it was out of the wedding, and apparently it's across the threshold when you get back from your honeymoon. So I just picked her up and I ran out with her <laughs> from, the, <laughs> from the wedding, and we have been having the time of our lives for 20 years. And I'm telling you, when you're in the middle of a fight, which will happen if you're married, married people, you know what I'm talking about, amen? It doesn't mean you don't love each other, but you will fight. Married people say Amen. It doesn't mean you don't love that person, but sometimes you've got to open up that photo album. You've got to go back to the 12 stones, and you've got to remember who you are. Someone say, remember. remember. You've got to remember. These are some of my memorials. Man, another one was when we added on to our family, um, and uh, this is kind of, you know, this was years ago. That little redhead is now 16 driving a car, yes. and Eli's trying to fight me all the time. And another one was whenever um, I stumbled upon this thing called mentoring. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I was like, well, if the Bible says to do that, I don't feel like me just preaching is discipling people. So I started taking young men under my wing, and we began to go deep in the paint, and, and, we, just, and we, 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 were, we were actually walking through what the Scripture said to do. This turned into a thing that would then mentor and disciple one on four, on one, and each of those four would take on four, and those four would each take on four. And we had hundreds of people being discipled at one time. And if anybody tells me that God ain't real, you can't tell me that these people, these young people being used of God to preach the word of God and to train the people around them, that will forever be. Those spears mean something to us. Those of us who made them know what they mean. 
as a memorial, as, a, as, as individuals we forget. So we have to remember. Our Wesley has 12 stones of memory. Back in 2007 when I got here, this ragtag group of about 10 people who became leaders came up with the name Tupos, which you sit in today. This was in our basement when we first got started. And, and we were lucky to have 50 people in the room. And God began to move, just like he does today, just with less people. Or like in, tw- in 2008, whenever we decided to start up the Maroon Platoon. <laughs> and the guy on the right was Justin Carpenter. This is before we had the Buffalo Head. And we have Joel Enriquez here. And he's, um, he works down at the, the, the bank now. And uh, he, he became our first homecoming king, and he became a lineage of that. That's where it started. That's when we took this brick, uh, this rock out of the bottom, and we put it up. And we said, do we remember when it started? Do we remember how God moved? Because when, one time we came to the um, Pigskin Review, and I remember it was in 2007. Went to the Pigskin Review, and there was like all the Greeks and the band and the cheerleaders and the football team. But where were the Christians? The Christians were an afterthought. We were a side mission. We were not the main thing. No, no one even really, really paid attention to Christians back then. There was no, it was no real like stronghold or beachhead to say, hey, we are here. And in 2009, we were like, we're going to change this. And so we started the Maroon Platoon. And right there, back in the back, I'm holding up in front of the bonfire, the spirit stick. I know it seems stupid. But that thing meant something that day. It meant we are here. And we're not going anywhere. And we're going to start to change the society around us. We're going to start to to march in on Jericho and AI. And we're going to start taking the land for Jesus. We're going to start bringing the peace of God into a dark, dark world. And then 2010, man, MP just kept growing. And it just kept growing. And it just kept growing. And we all grew the basement. That little ragtag group grew the basement. And in 2012, we took another stone out of that, that, that quarry, out of, out of the bottom of that river. And we put it up on the land when we moved to the ballroom. And uh, yeah, go ahead and change it to that one. No, yeah, that one. And in that ballroom, we set up these trussing. We ordered, it was the craziest story. We outgrew the basement one day. And I said, next week, we're going to be in the ballroom. I had no idea if we were going to able to even get the ballroom. And I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? And I was like, and God said, buy the equipment. It was like over $15,000. And I will bring in the money for it. I was like, okay. So I bought the, the trussing alone was $10,000 and some lights. And we had some sound system. We just pulled it all together. And then the next week we were in the ballroom. And there was 250 people there. And that altar was full of people giving their life to Christ there because there was space for them to do it. We took, man, all of us, Tracy, me, Carrie, all of us, we took that stone out of the bottom of that river, and we said, what has happened? That next year, we had a freshman party that had over a 1,000 people at it. We, the basement was packed full of people. The walls were sweating and dripping. I mean, we had a, we had a dance going out there we, out on the parking lot. We had a, this place was full, and we clicked through 777 through the front door, and then we opened up in the back, and all of a sudden, we couldn't count anymore, and it turned into well over 1,000 people in one night. And then we took that stone out, and we said, we can reach this many people. We had that many phone numbers to then follow up with and ask them, if they wanted a relationship with Jesus Christ. Wow, that's crazy. These are some of the stones out of the bottom of that river that belonged in somewhere else that that shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have been possible. In 2020, man, we had to go to to the fellowship hall at First Methodist down the street because we couldn't meet in public, but God told us to keep meeting in public anyway. And it brought a firestorm. People made videos about us. Oh, they were hating us. They were calling us all kinds of names. I got called into the president's office, and I remember God telling me and Cooper, me and Cooper were walking one night, and uh, God said, meet anyway, and I'm going to protect you from any outbreak. And I was like, oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> okay, cool. And he's like, and I want you to tell the president that. And I was like, oh, man. I'm going to sound like an idiot. So we went in. We walked in there, and all eyes were watching us. He had to make a scene of it, you know, because we had done bad. <laughs> got yelled at in my office for having hangouts during COVID. 
And uh, I was like, you know, I think there's something a little more dangerous than physical sickness. I think it's spiritual sickness and emotional sickness and suicide rates went way up. You remember that? I was like, uh, I'm not playing that game. We're going in for the soul. We took that rock out and I sat it down in front of President Wendler and I was like, there's not, there's not going to be an outbreak. God told me. And there wasn't one outbreak that whole year. That was a stone that didn't belong out here. But we took it from there and we put it there and we walked in faith as a people. That's who we are. A people of faith. Amen? And then we shouldn't have been able to get this in 2022. We got to come back to campus. We got right here in the ABH. This is a room that we dreamed about having because it's right in the center of everything. For so long, it's so much better for setup and teardown and everything like that so we can focus on people rather than setting up and tearing down. And this became a new stone that we put outside. And then this year, if you don't remember, man, we had no idea if we were going to be able to keep our building or not. There was a whole like church split thing that was going on, if you remember. And that building there, we were like, I don't know if my backpack is now going to be my office, but we're going to be faithful to God, even if it is. If my backpack's my office, then we'll just go out on campus, and that'll be our building. We knew it would hurt us, but, but God delivered us. And I was talking to a guy on the phone the other day from, from Mississippi. He's over all the Wesley Foundations in Mississippi, and he's like, wait, they just let you have your building? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the conference gave us $57,000 to get started. He's like, what? I said, yeah, and then one district gave us $30,000, another gave us $10,000. Oh, yeah, and then church just gave us $50,000. And uh, I think we're going to be covered for the year. And he was like, he had his hands on his head like, what is going on? This was a stone that did not belong out there. And we hold it, and we have a receipt saying, no, God's real, people. God is real. Devil can try to change it. He can try to change it and make it whatever he wants. But God is real. I got the receipt, y'all. I saw it with my own eyes. You've got to have your own 12 stones because the enemy's going to come knocking. He's going to kind of try to t- change your history and make you think that it's not real, that what you experienced here was just emotions or what you experienced here w- didn't really happen. You've got to hang on to it, man, and you've got to set that right there. So when your kids say, Dad, is God real? Say, oh, let me tell you, son. My son's knee was healed. We have the CT scan to show it. God is real. Graduates, Chase, I remember when you couldn't afford school and God provided more than you needed to be able to pay that off and other things too. Do you remember? And Jordan, you, you remember how you've been praying for that friend for years. And that friend's coming around to Jesus just now. You take that stone out of the river. Remember. And Jocelyn, when you experienced this spiritual and emotional healing one night when you were sitting there questioning back in the, back in the uh, fellowship hall at First Methodist and, and we were doing two posts and you're like, I don't know, maybe this isn't real. And Carrie stands up during worship and says, hold on, band, stop. I feel like God is telling me that somebody here is asking this very question. It was the very question on your mind. God showed you that he was real. And you're like, okay, I'm in. And you took that stone out of the river and you set it down. And you stood upon that rock of Christ Jesus and say, you can't, you can't dissuade me now. That's my receipt. Oh, Jocelyn, hold on to that stone. And Kayla, hmm, how, you, how you stepped out in faith and you're like, I, I, I want to have security of a regular job, but, but I feel like God's calling me to do music. And so God's just putting out these things. And all of a sudden, you're playing in all kinds of places. And I got to see you on Friday night, you and Byron playing. And you did a great job. And it's just enough to get through it. Take that out. God has continued to take care of you. And Reagan, man, you came to school and you felt God telling you to join the Zetas. And we're like, okay. And he said, I got, a, I got a heartbeat. I got a heartbeat for Greeks for Christ. I want to start this thing back up. And you and, and a few others here tonight started this whole thing up. That, that The first night had over like, what, 30, 40 people there? 45 people saying, I'm hungry for Jesus. You saw God move just like I did in high school in 1999. You pulled that rock right out of the river. And Lakin, oh my goodness, you were like the last one to sign up for the mission trip to Romania. And, and then, then somehow it was just paid for like before everybody else. <laughs> this is kind of crazy to me. 
and you were wondering if God wanted you to go, take that rock. Especially when you're in Romania and you're wondering, what am I doing here? Did I do the right thing? Was this just an emotional decision? No, no, no. You need to take that rock and set it out on the ground. Say, nope, I put my foot on that in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Brantley and Johnny, you guys, you guys were, were going along and you felt God say that you'd become an idol. So you broke up to put God first and then God gave you back to each other. And you got married and I stood there that day as you said your vows with your families there, and you got married, and here you are today. You put God first. You sought for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he's adding everything else to you. Connor, <laughs> my man, you, how you encountered the Holy Spirit your first semester here in such a real way that you say it changed the way that your whole college experience went. You're like, I know God's real. So when you leave this place and you're tempted to just go into just regular mundane whatever, remember what happened here. Amen? Keep that stone. Lane, my man, when you were delivered from those dark spirits in 2020, you remember that? People say, oh, what the heck? No, it's real. Jesus did it all the time. Why do we question it now? Was Jesus crazy? He cast out devils? Yeah. Yeah. And God did the same thing, and he freed you, and you've been walking in that freedom. Remember that. Don't forget the power of that freedom. And Kaylee Joe, where's Kaylee Joe? I'm in the back. You're in the back? Oh, you, you hiding back there. Kaylee Joe. The miracle of finding strong community, uh, Christians who were going the same speed and direction that you were going, that, uh, that helped build you up. That will continue on in your next, in your next, in your next assignment. And Emma. I remember whenever um, Amy, who wears Amy at, when Amy wasn't even a believer, I remember this because you were like, Mikey, uh, Amy wants to give her life to Christ. Can you call her? I said, no, you call her. You know what to do. You remember? And you're like, I don't know what to know. You do. And that night you, you took that stone out of the river and you put it up on the bank. And Amy gave her life to Christ. And listen, Amy was so quiet. Like she was so quiet. Like, like no one, uh, she wouldn't say a word to anybody. And now she's our guest care team leader, man. God brought the rock. God can do anything. And if he did it then, he can do it again. He can do it again. And victory, do you remember when God provided for you? When you didn't have a job, but somehow a weird scholarship would come in and some other thing, random thing would happen. And all of a sudden you got a car. Do you remember that? Oh my gosh, don't forget it. Don't forget it when the hard times come because the enemy will try to take that from you, but you got your receipt. You got your receipt and Carolyn, it's Carolyn. Mm. God provided those meaningful relationships that you say healed you almost in an instant from past pain. Yeah, there you are. How you learned how to hear the voice of God when you got here. Mm. There's such a long story to that, but the basic is that. And Tulu, how you were at Tupos, and God gave you that vision, and then two weeks later, like actually, um, uh, you were preaching about it just a couple weeks ago, people. Remember that when Tulu preached? Yeah. And she was like, you've got to have faith. God will come through. The very next day, he answered all the things that she was talking about, by the way. <laughs> I don't know if we got to announce that. <laughs> if God did it then, he'll do it again. So Joshua and the priest set up at the Jordan, and they step in. They don't step out. They don't freak out. They step in. And the waters go back. Strangely, it pushes them back to Adam, a town called Adam. By the way, Adam brought sin into the world. Jesus pushed it back to Adam. We walk across on dry ground into the promised land. That's another story for another day. Joshua 420. Someone say 420. 420. And Joshua set up at Gilgal. We're changing 420 up in here. He set up at Gilgal the 12 stones that they had taken out of the Jordan. And he said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean, Daddy? <laughs> tell them. Someone say, tell them. Tell Someone say, you got to tell them. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Someone say, tell them. 
When they ask, what is the reason for the hope that you have? You, someone say, you got to tell them. You got to tell them. Tell them what the Lord has done. What do these stones mean, Daddy? Tell them Israel crossed over the Jordan on dry ground. This wasn't a wind that might have blown some kind of murky water and around the weeds. Bull crap. Don't let them change your history. Don't let them change your history. This was deep water. It was overflowing the banks. It says what it says and it means what it says. And God let you dry, cross over on dry ground. That is a miracle. Worship team, you can come. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he did to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had all crossed over. He did this. Why did he do this? Why? So that this, so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful. That God is real. So what is your reason? What is your stones? Your 12 stones.